this is great, and I just took note that there are at least three men here on top of the people running the technical equipment. <laughs> Um, and I, I didn't know exactly what to say, but I thought I'd just go through the chronology. I'm not a spring chicken anymore. And I've seen real changes as I've gone through my career. So what my, what my career amounted to was um, I got married, actually, during my PhD time. Because as we started to think about making a move together, uh, my significant other and I wanted to be able to negotiate as a couple. And a lot of people do the opposite. We can talk about that. But it really worked to our advantage. And then I got stuck in a perpetual postdoc, which is another thing maybe we can talk about, research track faculty. So um, after seven years of, of marriage, I decided to go off the pill and have my first kid, and what the heck. And it happened that just the month I delivered my first child, I got my first NIH R01 as well. So everything worked out dandy. Um, then, again, we had to move, and the moves were always the most critical. Um, uh, we interviewed all over the place for quite a period of time, and then finally we both landed jobs in Boston, at, at Harvard, um, in, in a clinical environment which was a, a compromise for me, but it turned out okay. But after a certain number of years, we both got a little bit dissatisfied, um, they were stalling for, for, for tenure and so on and so forth. And um, again, it was impossible to move as a couple. And thank goodness we had the wisdom to move to a very large town when we did move because we both found other jobs within Boston. So that, that was really helpful. I went to um, an independent research institute, BBRI, and I got a, a leadership position I was very happy with as um, director and CEO of that small research institute. But I got tired of that, missed academia after a while, and was able to move again to Boston University, where um, I'm, I'm chair of my department, and I've just been asked to be interim dean for a year. So I've been doing a lot of administration, in addition to the family, in addition to um, uh, the research. And the research is definitely the most challenging. Keeping it funded, keeping it staffed and such, um, is what really um, takes a lot of effort. Okay, and so the one thing I wanted to say is that I've seen tremendous progress. As a graduate student, I would go to national meetings when I'd start to doze off. I'd keep myself awake by trying to count the number of women in the audience. And really, there'd be 200 people and I'd find maybe three women. So if you can imagine those days, and now you look around, it must be at least 60% female in all scientific sessions. But as you go up the ranks, you know, then I started looking at faculty. And when I was first an assistant professor, I was the only female as far as I could see. And then when I, when I became a chair, still, they hold, in the social sciences it's different, but they hold a, a meeting of biomedical science chairs at BU. And just last year I walked into that room for the first time and I was the only woman the only woman all across huge Boston University campus that's a chair. Um, okay, so, but there has been a tremendous amount of progress. I wanted to emphasize that because it's encouraging to me. It was hopeless, really, when I got started, but I didn't know any better. Um, the, other, the other tip I was just going to mention is you just have to have your partner share the family life. There's, there's no way you can hold down two full-time jobs and research certainly, at least, is a full-time job. If you compromise, you won't be competitive. So, I mean, um, at the time my first son was born, I turned to my husband and I said, you hate my cooking, you're going to do the cooking from now on. <laughs> and he did, and he loves it, and he does the grocery shopping and such. There's things they won't do, but you can get them to do a good chunk of it. <laughs> um, and then the other, the other thing I wanted to just mention was uh, multitasking. So particularly if you're going to do diverse things, you have to get really good at multitasking. And the more things you can learn on how to do that, the better. Um, but the biggest tip I can give you is get yourself a good administrative assistant and delegate. So, and I could stop there. How many minutes is that? <laughs> and let's delegate to the next. <laughs>
Hi, my name is Rafida Hanim with the Mokhtar. I'm 41 years old. I'm a mother of six kids. Um, the eldest, <laughs> the eldest are 16, and the youngest is two years old, eh? and she's still breastfeeding. Okay, she's still breastfeeding. So um, it, it doesn't look like I'm going to stop, um, but I think <laughs> six is enough. Okay. Um, I come from Malaysia, which is a majority of uh, predominantly uh, Muslims, um, with Islam as a religion of federation. And I would like to start this session by just um, uh, informing you that in Malaysia, um, the number of women in the workforce um, is, to me, is quite encouraging. We have 47.3% of women in the workforce, which has increased because in, in uh, nine years back, it's about 44%. Okay? Um, but it's just that um, when it comes to the number of women in the decision-making position, we don't fare quite well. So we are around 26%. But I would like to believe that um, the study by Fonton, uh, one, one what they call company that look into statistics and data, is actually um, uh, focusing on uh, CEO, chairman and directors. Because in academic, I think Prof. Susan would have seen it, um, there are more female lecturers in the physiology department and um, out of three head departments, two are females. So in the academic, we fare quite well in the decision-making positions. And I believe um, because um, it's the choice of the women themselves. They probably are talented, skilled, but they would like to actually stop at that <coughs> level. Okay, They don't want to go higher uh, up in the position there. Um, and in Malaysia, I think what uh, what you call help us to actually move uh, the women uh, to higher up is because of the policy um, of the government where the education uh, opportunity is equal. In fact, most of parents would like to see that their daughters are working as well. Um, so they would like themselves to be supported by parents. So there is no longer stigma that we used to have in 1970s where women should be in the kitchen. And you know, um, as Prof. Cathy put it, you know, you, you have to know how to cook and you have to know how to cook well. Okay, so now we are also sharing those uh, values with our men. Okay, now <coughs> I think, um, in fact, sometimes um, when we look into the science um, arena in our country, uh, because of the science subject, you need a very, uh, what you call, uh, working hard, reading hard and all. We see some inequality where now more women are in science stream rather than men. Okay, so, in fact, our Ministry of Education are panicking, so they are trying to uh, you know, keep the balance uh, there. Um, and um, the other things, uh, a lot of social uh, factors contribute for women pursuing science in Malaysia. Uh, for example, um, we have actually, apart from um, what you call uh, equal opportunity, we also have um, extended family uh, culture, which is still alive, you know. Um, you have a big family living with you, so you have grandparents looking after the kids when you go to work and all. Okay? And uh, we also have a school system that cater um, to the needs of mother, where uh, we have a choice to send our kids to private school. So this private school, uh, they start at 8 and they finish around 4, so just as the mothers are finishing their work. Um, <clears throat> and then... Um, I think what is most important as a Muslim country, uh, in Islam itself, it is not uh, uh, what you call a hindrance for a woman to go working if she can help the husband to actually support the family. Okay, so that is one value that the Muslims in uh, Malaysia have that actually boost our uh, involvement in, in science uh, research. Um, so a bit about myself, okay, um, I, was, I graduated um, as a medical doctor uh, at the age of 25. Then I had to pursue my, uh, I had to do my compulsory service for three years before I took up um, PhD. Um, it's supposed to be four years, okay? Now I had my, uh, the first two babies when I was doing housemanship, okay? That was a very critical period, but I have a very supporting husband and uh, my parents and parents-in-law. Um, my PhD, I'm supposed to finish in four years, but I decided to print little thesis in between, in the form of my children. 
So, you know, um, I did my PhD in six, six years because I wanted to expand my family as well because I don't want to actually have more kids when I know uh, my age is catching up. Okay, so, it is allowed in Malaysia to actually do that and because of the support system, I managed through. I'm now the head of department of physiology uh, unit in the, my university. So, as a conclusion, um, I think <clears throat> there are actually um, plenty of opportunities uh, opportunity for us women in Malaysia to actually pursue um, higher up. It's just that it's a matter of choice whether we want it or not. Okay? So depending on the family size, depending on the commitment, we decide what we want. And we, we, didn't, we didn't like quota as well. There has been move to say that, you know, um, we must have a certain numbers for women in these positions and all. But we think that that is not proper because we're just filling up quota. We think that if you want us to be in the decision-making uh, science positions, then what you call um, choose us because we are skillful and we are talented. Okay. So lastly, because um, uh, as I said, I come from a, a Islamic uh, country, and um, I am allowed to actually plan my family to accommodate my career. And except for the two, the first two kids which I fail miserably, they are born one year after another. The four. Remaining four, I managed to actually displace them. So they don't come when I was having a critical period of exam or doing lab work and all. And in that sense, I, I, I managed to actually put myself now in a, a positions where I can also uh, do NGO work. Okay, as Prof. Katie said just now, uh, what you call um, a jug multitasking and juggling. So I'm also involved in a women's NGO called Manita Isma there, which now allow me to actually assist another woman and uh, you know, teenagers to actually uh, you know, be confident and move forward you know, in science. I think that's about all. Thank you very Thank much. Hi, Rafida, my respects to you because when I had one child and my husband wanted another one, I said, let's see how this one is. <laughs> and after one year of noticing a super active kid, I said, no, this is enough. I love her. That's it. So what we're um, talking about today has been around a question that has been around for a long, long time. And oh, how do I move this? And I guess that, you know, I just try to make a presentation so that I wouldn't keep on speaking for more than five minutes because I tend to do that also. <laughs> and many of the things that have been said, I think I share. But the one thing that I think is the most important in my very personal um, experience is what you have inside, what comes from within. So determination and resilience. I come from a family of immigrants. My mother is Muslim, my father is Jewish. And it's possible. <laughs> Peace is possible. And um, since uh, immigrant parents tend to expect a lot from the children, and I was expected to be, you know, to, to perform all my life. So juggling balls is not a new thing for me. Um, so I think that for me also has been important to see examples. My two main mentors were women. One of them had a, a sing she was a single mother. She had a child. She was my PhD mentor, and now she's the director of our institute, which, by the way, is one of the best of the university, and which has 50 and 50 percent, 50 ma 50 percent males, 50 percent females. And my other mentor was Sharona Gordon, who is now the incoming editor of Journal of General Physiology, she, who has four children, and she's also been uh, a great inspiration. My mother, who was a nurse, my father, who was a physicist, who founded an institute at our university, which is the Institute for uh, Nuclear Sciences. So that pushed me very much. He, founding an institute in a country that does not appreciate as much science is hard. He had to work many, many hours a day, but still had time for me to teach me math, to teach me physics. So um, that was an, uh, a very good uh, help for my career. So uh, how to do it? Well, get help and plan for things that make it easier for you. Um, Getting help from family, friends, and even a nanny if you have the ability. My parents now are older. Uh, my father is an emeritus professor, so he can take care of my child. <laughs> um, and also, so another thing that has been said is uh, have a spouse in the same city. That helps a lot. <laughs> and plus, he's a scientist too. My kid is here. My baby's here. Um, he's off at the aquarium with her right now. 
And uh, the one thing that I believe is that if you're good at what you're doing, everything is going to be very easy. Um, if not easy, it will be possible to do. So uh, I have chosen a nearby school because it sounds obvious to you, but Mexico has 23 million people. And that means a lot of cars and a lot of traffic. And maybe one mile can you know, signify an hour of driving. So I have a nearby school for my little baby. I enroll her in, in after, after school activities so that I have more time at my lab. And I have an excellent uh, work team that helps me delegate things. When I, was, when I had my baby, well, I went through a lot of, um, of lost pregnancies. <laughs> and finally, when Maya came, uh, I, had, I delivered her exactly the week that our, one of our big papers reviews came. Um, it was a paper in Nature, but it was very important for me so that I could get tenure. I really wanted the paper to be accepted. And so I had them over at my house while I was breastfeeding, and I explained to them how to do the experiments, and the team did it. So that was, that was fantastic. Um, don't feel guilty. It's really about the quality and not the quantity of the time. We tend to feel guilty all the time that we're leaving our kids. And then we do things like, you know, um, spoil them. So don't feel guilty about doing it. And say no when you can't do it. All right? Uh, there are some more things that are more important. Try to compartmentalize and to organize yourself so that you can do everything together. So uh, the things that don't help at our university is bureaucracy. We spend a lot of time filling up papers, and grants can take a year to get by, and, and uh, you know, materials and chemicals can take three or four months. So how to tackle these things? Ah, and the other thing is uh, most of our workforce is students. These are people who need training. We don't have many postdocs. So manage the size of your team so to have more one-on-one -on -one time because these are students that need your training. Encourage teamwork. Let them all work together in different projects. Don't assign a project to a single person. I mean, there should always be somebody else to help. Collaborate with other people in your department. Have regular lab meetings and allow for communication of results in all possible forms. I have people chatting with me in the internet at 4 o'clock in the morning when it's necessary. So that really helps the work in my lab. And this is my best experiment. <laughs> yeah, good afternoon, lady uh, physiologist and great scientist. My name is Anziso Yebisi. I come from the Department of Veterinary Physiology and Pharmacology, University of Illinois. I thank the organizers of the program for giving me this opportunity to talk. In the past 40 to 50 years, women were not studying physiology in Nigeria. And the few who found themselves in physiology were very brilliant students who were retained to complete BSc Physiology, and after that, they now continue to complete their medical course. And you can see the ratio of men to women in physiology departments in Nigeria. Pre-70s, maybe one woman in a department of five to seven men. In 70s to 80s, the story was almost the same. 80s to 90s, it improved, maybe two or one, <laughs> ten, to eight or to ten. In the late 80s, you can see that there was an improvement. We have four, five, or six in some departments. Now, what was the cause of this? There was an early neglect of allowing ladies to study science pre-70s in my country. But later, in 70s, late 70s, well, awareness was coming. In the 80s, you see that more and more awareness and there was improvement. Then, in the 80s, 90s, there were uh, some women activities was coming up and you have gender activities. Later, 90s, beyond till this time, there was a lot of focus on women empowerment. Female working in the universities, physiology not an exception, had a lot of disadvantages just because they were women. Nowadays, things are getting better. Gender studies have improved tremendously in my country. Well, what was the reason? The reason was that women would not be able to 
handle technical challenges and probably uh, administrative, greater administrative responsibilities, women will not be able to take care of it. Those were the reasons why women were denied the opportunity. Well, from my perception, the only women in physiology in Nigeria are all happily married, have children, and have become professors. Although not easy to get there, some have spent 10 years or more before finishing PhD, and they are to combine it with marriage and child care. Some had the support of their husbands, some did not. All sorts of threats. She may be better than me if I allow her to study. She didn't want to sleep with me. What's her problem? Where is she going? She wants to go to the Amu. What does she want to become? Those are the kind of threats that women receive from men. Let me call it that. There are a lot of improvements in the past few years. Human physiologists have been made heads of departments. We have a deputy vice chancellor in our midst here, and she was an acting vice chancellor in person of Professor Latuji Bello of Lagos State University, Lagos. And we have, I don't know if she's around, to Professor Egoroje, who is a rep of the Organization of Women in Science in the Developing World, and she's the Nigeria representative. So there's a lot of improvement in my country too. At this conference, we had over 3,000 delegates, 93 from Nigeria, and 13 women physiologists, with three from other science departments. You can look at the ratio, 13 to 93, 1 to 7.2. <laughs> now, what do we do next? A lot. We should evaluate and celebrate success because we are becoming successful. We are getting there gradually. We should become role models. We should try and design mentor scheme. Yabai will be able to mentor people coming behind us. And we should be sisters and mothers to the young ones coming behind us. I don't want to go beyond my five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Talk. My name is Yvonne Hodgson. I'm from Monash University in... No, no, it's fine. Okay, so I'm from Monash University in Australia. Um, okay, so I'm just going to talk. I don't have any slides. Um, okay, I handed my PhD in in 1982 and things were very different then to, to now. The day after I handed my PhD and I got on a plane with my husband because his next job was in the UK. So that pretty much put a, an end to my first postdoc. And, um, and I had my first baby within six weeks of arriving in the UK. So I had my family early, um, and my husband was training to be a surgeon. So for his entire career, he worked between 80 to 100 hours a week. So that meant that he was not available to help me with childcare. And in fact, he never once was able to drop the children off at the crash or pick them up. So when we came back to Australia, I started my first postdoc, which was um, reasonably, well, it was, I was working with a very sexist man, a clinician, who wouldn't put my name on any publications. So I spent 12 months working with him and then moved on um, back to the group that I did my PhD with. And, um, and they were better, they weren't quite as sexist, but things were still tough. Um, you know, I was a mother and uh, they would have 8 o'clock mornings uh, meetings and they would have meetings at 5.30 at night. And while their children were at creche, because I had a second child during my second um, PhD, my second postdoc, while the children were at creche, that was okay to handle to a certain extent. Uh, but once my older son uh, started school, I found it really difficult actually. There wasn't before school care, so um, I had to arrange for someone else to look after him at 8 o'clock. The creche finished at 5.30, I had to pick him up from school, go to the creche, get my son, go home, get a babysitter and then come back. And the attitude of the research at that point was that if you couldn't manage your children, um, then you shouldn't be in the workforce. And I'm happy to say that things have changed now and that research groups at Monash are much more accommodating of women and they don't have those sort of meetings. But then my husband had to go overseas again. He was training cardiothoracic surgery this time when we came back to the UK. And that happened at a crucial time in my research career. Um, and so we came to the UK, and when we then went back to, the, um, to Monash, 
I went back to the research group, but I was really evaluating what I wanted to do, and I did want to have another baby, so I decided I would take six weeks, six years off. Um, I did want to work as a research assistant so that I could keep up my technical skills, but within that research group they said that was not possible. Uh, nowadays it would be possible for a woman to step down and work for a number of years um, just to maintain her research skills and then um, once the children are older get back further on. So basically I stayed home for six years. I was the stay at home mum, I was supporting my husband and helping him establish his own um, uh, surgical career. And, um, and I learned a lot of skills during that time, actually, a lot of admin skills, which then um, I drew on when I then went back to, um, to university. I actually made the decision to be a teacher and I went and did a dip head in those six years. And then once I'd finished that and my youngest son was starting school, I went back to the university to get a reference to, um, to get a job in teaching. And it was Graham Jenkin at Monash University who said to me, hey, we've got a job here in Physiol, why don't you come and work with us? Um, so I did. So I was working in Physiol um, for uh, three days a week part-time, just in the teaching labs. And that was really the beginning of my career in education. So, and I found the people in education at Monash very supportive. And I progressed from um, assistant lecturer to lecturer to senior lecturer, and now to associate professor. Um, with, between that time, um, when my youngest child started um, school to now. So my children, I have three boys, are all fully grown. The oldest is 31 and the youngest is 23. And, um, and so they're all well-adjusted um, young men who are very proud of their mother for her, um, for her career, which, which I think is great. They value me not just for my nurturing as a mother, but also for my intelligence and my contribution that I've made um, in terms of my work. Um, I could not have really progressed um, in my education career without a number of key people supporting me and mentoring me. And um, I found people opened doors for me, they challenged me, pushed me outside of my comfort zone and gave me positions of responsibility and leadership. In fact, uh, you know, some people had more confidence in my ability than I did. Um, but anyway, it's, it's worked out and I've had a very good career in education and now I'm doing education research. So my publications are not just in the phys advances of physiology education, they're in broader education um, journals. And for me, that's been a real mind shift. I've had to learn new methodologies and I publish in journals that my physiology colleagues would never read. Um, but it all adds to my um, profile, my national profile and international profile and in what I contribute to the university. So, um, so I guess in terms of juggling the balls, um, early on when I had young children, um, they were at the creche and I had, um, I had someone come in and help me with the home, with the housework, so they would also do the ironing. And, um, and then when my children were at school, I had a woman who would pick them up and bring them home and look after them until I got home. And her name was Pat. And really without her support, I would not have been able to progress um, up the up the promotional tree, and she was great for my for my children too. And I did feel guilty um, while I was doing all this, but your kids turn out all right, and so it's it's pointless to feel guilty. And I think if the mother is happy and content, and the father is happy and content, then the children will be um, well adjusted and will also turn out to be um, good adults. Um, my husband, although he worked long hours. He did support me morally and um, he supported me financially. So I knew that whatever decisions I made, he would support me in that. So juggling the balls, I think you have to get the help, um, as Kathleen said, and, um, and you need the support of your partner. Okay, that's all. <laughs> Thank you very much for the audience. Uh, I'm from Sao Paulo State. My, the name of my university is University of Sao Paulo, and uh, called UNESP, is the countryside of the state. It's okay. My family now is myself, my daughter, Anna, she's 23, and the male family now is Luke. <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to uh, 
uh, show my career and family career and then change for a career family because in some time in my timeline I uh, have some kind of uh, chaos in my family so I did my master's degree in, in my daughter was born and after that I went to do my KG in USA uh, that was a kindergarten that is very nice in the United States after that uh, I went to London to do my postdoc, but when I returned to Brazil after my postdoc, is a kind of in Brazil the school time is part time, so uh, I need to choose some thing, and it was not so easy. So I uh, got a divorce, <coughs> and after I took care of my daughter by myself. So it's a kind of chaos in your life because you need to get your career, your life, your house, everything. But I got in 2011 a uh, full professor in my university. So I uh, chose this, this cartoon because why only the monster career is for women, not all, not for men. I don't know if you can read. <laughs> And it's a kind of nightmare. You need to choose between your career and family sometimes. It's not always. And I, as a scientist, I chose to compare my uh, career with a, a, a male friend. So, uh, sorry. So we did the same. We uh, have the nursing school. We went to a master degree that we have in Brazil. Is the it's, uh, normal. And we did. In, I did in pharmacology, and uh, he did in physiology. I did uh, in physiology my PhD, and he did in physiology. And we became the same at university. We are in different uh, university, but when we compare our career, uh, I have. Uh, do I have a pointer here or not? Is the in the middle? Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, I have uh, uh, 57 papers, and he has 140 papers. I have some, some chapter books. And uh, uh, about mentoring, we have quite the same master, PhD, and postdoc. I have some uh, prize. And the most important. Uh, <laughs> I uh, I am uh, I try to do uh, to publish the work of my students. This is the reason I have the 50% as a, a last a last author, and he has a 13%. What it means that it's not a bad thing, but uh, uh, regarding to male, because they have cooperation, collaboration. They uh, they can travel more sometimes that we can do. And uh, so it's not bad thing to have the collaboration. It's a nice thing, but sometimes you you can't do. And uh, another, I don't have a wife. He has a wife. Maybe I should change my sexual orientation. <laughs> and am I different from the other women in my country? And we can see here is a kind of uh, funding, CNPQ, that is a federal uh, funding. And we can see here that when you are in the lower level of the stratification in your career, you can have a 50% for male and female. Homens means uh, male and uh, mulheres means uh, female, okay? It's the blue and the, the uh, red. Uh, however, when you go to the high level, it, this kind of proportion uh, change. It's uh, quite normal. And the, uh, what about the fellowship and grants? In Brazil, we have this kind of uh, stratification in fellowship, starting in number two and uh, finishing. The highest level is uh, 1A. And of course, I'm in the lower level, the lowest one, AZ. Angelina Zanesco, and my male friend is in one B. Uh, so we start the same, but we are not in the same level now. Uh, and what about uh, Sao Paulo? Sao Paulo is the richest state in Brazil. And uh, the most of the, um, I think there's about 60 to 7 percent of research in Brazil uh, are from uh, Sao Paulo. 
and it's not different. I got it, uh, it's the name of a research foundation of Sao Paulo, is what we call FAPESP. Uh, they have now created in 2013 uh, 17 uh, uh, center, uh, research center. It's not different from the uh, federal agency. 23% uh, only female as a PI scientist and 77% uh, are male scientists. And the, a lot of money with this kind of uh, research center. It's still the same. Uh, so there is a glass ceiling in Brazil. It's around 20, 25% that we, women can get some kind of uh, career and funding in the, all the grants. And the, my conclusion, I'm sorry about the chair, but I did a conclusion because it's, uh, I <laughs> took some time. So should the measurement tools, assessment, and evaluation process be different between men and women? No, the, the, the tools is, uh, are right, and we don't wanna change. But for, in my opinion, uh, we need code. Uh, I am from physical education department, and the, I don't know if you are familiar with Olympic Games. There is a golden medal for men, if they are running the best, and gold medals for women. Uh, we are different. We have different background and feelings and how to manage the career. So I'm not, uh, it's kind of, oh, coach is a kind of, oh, you are, a nice is uh, no. It's important to have codes because we are different and we don't run exactly like men run. Okay, thank you. But um, we're now ready to take any questions, <laughs> any comments um, from you guys. Don't be shy, and I'm sure once the first person starts, there'll be. Ten more, but um, anything that you want to disagree with or agree with? Yes, please. Hello, thanks very much for hosting this. It's been really informative. I had two points. First of all, um, I was lucky enough to have my mother with me when I was growing up because my father, he worked a lot of hours, and I have to say I benefited from having her around. However, on the other hand, I'm really encouraged hearing people speak to kind of give us the justification to say it's okay to take a break you can catch up, don't worry, you know, there, it is possible if you make it possible, but thanks very much for this, it's been fa like fascinating, thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. And in this um, booklet, one of, more than one of the examples are from women who've had breaks, and so what I like about this booklet is none of us are straight arrows, you know, I want to be a vice chancellor and I'm going to do it by a physio. <laughs> oh, you know, it isn't like that, is it? It's a wavy pathway. So you'll see examples. Thank you for that comment. I don't know whether anybody wants to add. Yeah. Yvonne. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to add to that. Um, if you employ people to do the housework and to, and to do your ironing, that frees you up so that on the weekends when you're not working, you can actually have fun with your kids. And I think when... When you, when you are working full time, you're very conscious of the fact that you don't have a lot of time with your kids. And so what you do is you make that time count. <coughs> and you do fun things, you know, you take them places and do things so that they have all those memories. And you develop a good relationship with them. So I think some, someone said it was quality, not quantity. And I think that's really true. Mm. But they will always remember and remind you of that time you failed. Around, <laughs> <laughs> you know, their birthday time, you know, together. <laughs> you, know, you know, another option, too, that I wanted to mention is, um, um, at least in the States, it's such a big country that um, the kids often don't get to know their grandparents. But at the time that daycare cost more than my take-home pay, um, we offered to have my mother-in-law. It's the ultimate sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she never left. <laughs> so I ended up doing elder care at the, at the end of the process. But my, my kids really got to know their grandmother and um, really had a, a marvelous relationship with her, too, that I was a little jealous of. But it, mm -hmm. it was good for them. Yeah. Okay, there's a hand to go into the back, please. Stand up. Yeah. Um, just, I, I was just wondering, um, just out of interest really, um, two things from everybody else. I was wondering how many people here have kids? Um, maybe just put your hand up. 
And then how many have brought their kids to this meeting? It's great that there is childcare. It is great that in these days there is some childcare, isn't it? <laughs> My daughter now is 23, but uh, when she was uh, one year and a half, she was uh, like uh, attending many meetings in Brazil and the outside of Brazil. And maybe this is the reason that she escaped from biological science and <laughs> history science. Maybe. I think it's all right at the back. Thank you. Um, I'm Aboy Goroji. I actually trained in the University of Glasgow in Scotland some 26 years ago. I got my PhD. and missed out on my postdoc because I had to go back home on the command of my husband. <laughs> so I gave up the opportunity and went back home and struggled through without proper mentorship. So I'm so encouraged to be here just now to you know, see the positive side. It's like we're looking at a glass of water half full rather than half empty. Because right now we grapple with a lot of hindrances, especially in our environment. And that is why we have organizations like the one that, uh, I, that we have for the developing world. We have an organization called um, Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World that goes uh, 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 trans transcends through four continents, the African continent, the Arab, the Latin America and the Caribbean, and the Asian region. Our current president is a, is a Chinese uh, professor in the Chinese Academy of Science. I happen to be the African representative for the region, the vice president. You know, and we have been grappling with issues that you know, deal with women in science and the, the, the challenges that we, we face uh, daily. Uh, and most times you find that we women are usually our own enemies from within and we are also our own enemies you know, uh, around us. So we, we hardly mentor each other in a positive way. Uh, and um, unfortunately, especially when it comes to decision making uh, positions and policy making positions, even though right now we have a first lady who uh, is said to be very uh, positively predisposed in having women in positions of authority, you know, and decision making, we are still not there yet. And I am gaining a lot. The thing I've gained here is the positive attitude that we need to uh, have. Because that's all that I've just got from here. I'm not sure that. Most of us are not uh, unaware of the challenges that we face as individuals as, and as well as a, a group, as women. Uh, that's just what I wanted to uh, bring out to the house and to thank the house for encouraging me right now so that I will take a more positive attitude back home. <laughs> so, yes, thank you so much. Um, I'm just conscious of the time and um, Dennis Noble, the president of IEPS, has agreed to make some closing remarks for us. And then we, after that, all those who need to go away at two can, and of course the rest of us can congregate outside and carry on chatting and networking. <laughs> Dennis, yeah. please. Yes. Um, the first thing to say is that um, IUPS subscribes to ICSU, which is the International Council of Science. The International Council of Science is responsible for the principle of universal universality, which is the statement um, in Statute 5 of ICSU. The principle of universality is, of course, no discrimination, free circulation. And that include, includes, of course, no discrimination on the basis of gender, um, as well as no discrimination on the basis of country of origin, uh, ethnic um, characteristics, and so on. And so, IUPS Council takes the issue of gender equality very seriously indeed. Sufficiently so that at the first of these meetings in uh, Kyoto in 2009, uh, I attended the meeting as um, the incoming president of IUPS. More than that, we encouraged the organisers of that symposium to produce a report for IUPS, which they did, and it was in fact um, Junko Kimura in Japan who um, brought the report together and Susan Ray who presented it to IUPS Council. <coughs> you might think that writing reports and just uh, getting them seen by a council which is still more than 
men um, is just throwing the pearls out to swine. It's not true. We've got a president who is determined on this issue and who has repeatedly um, referred to ICSU Statute 5 as a principle that must be adhered to. So I would encourage you, if there is a way to do so, to try to bring some of the items from the meetings this time um, through into the form of a report. Council will guarantee that it will publicise it, it will talk about it, and it will try to spread the word. I've only just two brief comments on the actual presentations. Um, they've been great, and it's been great fun to uh, listen to them, though obviously behind the how should I put it, the confidence of those who have been presenting. There must also have been a lot of sweating and tears. Um, I, I, I think the important thing to get across uh, to people is the juggling has to be shared. I mean, if inevitably, women are more involved in child rearing. Why not the man being the cook, gardener, head <laughs> bottle washer, shopper, and so on? <laughs> Perfectly possible. Some of us do it. Um, the other thing that I take home from the uh, contributions is the huge role of models, mentoring and uh, moral strength. The three M's, mor models, mentoring and moral strength, seem to me to be the key things that could make a difference and which, according to some of the statistics that have been presented here, are beginning to make a difference. So, congratulations on a great meeting. I'm sure the one yesterday was great too, and I'm sure the one tomorrow will be. And you've only got to look at how this hall is completely packed. So congratulations to the team for producing it and for a very interesting symposium. Thank you.